So the first speaker today is Dr. James Davey. James is currently a, a consultant resource geologist at SRK Consulting and has academic and industry experience of a wide range of deposit stars, including sediment hosted copper deposits like we're going to be talking about today, layered ultramafic intrusions, orogenic gold and industrial minerals. The majority of James's experience has been focused on various exploration projects and mine sites across southern and central Africa, with a particular focus on the geochemistry and ore forming processes in sedimentary basin environments. James completed a PhD in 2019 at the University of Southampton and in collaboration with the Natural History Museum in London, investigating the hydrothermal fluid chemistry and fertility indicators in several sediment hosted copper provinces including the Central African Copper Belt and the Kalahari Copper Belt. So with that being said, over to you, James. Thanks, Jamie. That, was, that turned into a bit of a, more of a mouthful than uh, I realised when I sent it to you. Um, cool. Thank you very much. So just to get... Uh -huh. Okay. So uh, I guess before we get started, uh, I'd just like to thank my co-authors, um, Steve Roberts and Jamie Wilkinson, and acknowledge the support of these various institutions um, who have supported the, the work through my PhD, uh, whether financially or otherwise. So I'm aware I'm fairly short on time with this presentation, um, so I'm going to largely skip over many of the introductory aspects of the Central African Copper Belt, um, but I'm hoping everyone was able to tune in to, to Dave Sally and Kuhn's talks this morning. Um, they both gave really good overviews of the Copper Belt, uh, and in particular, the, the kind of paleo hydrological aspects of the basin. So on the back of that, I'm going to jump straight into the, the fluid story and think, um, think about generation of brines more broadly. So in sedimentary basins, we can break down the dominant processes for concentrating a brine into two end members, uh, where one is the generation of, of so-called residual or bitten brines uh, through the evaporation of seawater, and the other is through uh, the dissolution of in situ evaporite deposits. And it's not unusual for both of these processes to, be, to occur uh, diachronously within a single basin system. Now, although uh, the dissolution of in situ salt deposits, I guess, is a, a fairly intuitive way of increasing the salinity of a fluid, the generation of salinity in, in residual brines is perhaps slightly less intuitive process. So this is a plot of how the concentrations of various ions, which are, are plotted on the y-axis, evolve through increasing degrees of evaporation, which is uh, plotted along the x-axis. So you can see as you begin to evaporate seawater, which, which is at the kind of origin of the, this plot, most ions are increasingly concentrated until the solution becomes saturated with respect to gypsum, uh, and then eventually halite uh, around this point here. And once you've reached halite saturation, clearly your sodium concentrations then decrease with progressive uh, evaporation as you continue to drop sodium chloride out of solution. All the while, concentrations of the, the bitten salts, namely uh, potassium and magnesium, so potassium is the red diamonds here, magnesium are the, the pink squares on this plot, they slowly increase in the residual brine right up until quite high degrees of evaporation. Um, and, and you can imagine if you tap a brine uh, around this, the, this stage, um, denoted by the red arrow or the red box in this, um, then you, you essentially produce a very dense, very saline brine uh, packed full of, of your, your bitten salts. One final important point to make on this slide is the behavior of, of bromine, which is this um, pink line with blue circles on it. Uh, and that's because it behaves particularly conservatively um, through evaporation. And that means it stays in the residual brine. So it just becomes progressively more and more concentrated through the evaporation cycle. And it's that characteristic of bromine which becomes particularly useful when it comes to distinguishing the source of one brine from another. Um, the left hand plot here is taken from uh, James Nowecki's work in the Copper Belt, and it shows the chlorine bromine ratio of fluids split by their interpreted host vein kinematics uh, from various Zambian Copper Belt deposits. And although not conclusive, uh, these data begin to suggest a link between uh, brines hosted in kinematically earlier veins and an evaporitic or a re residual origin. Um, 
and those have lower chlorine bromine ratios so they plot to the left of this uh, seawater line which is the the blue dashed line here uh, and then later fluids uh, which display much higher chlorine bromine ratios uh, which is typically uh, attributed to a component of, of halite dissolution. And I've nabbed a couple of plots here on the right hand side from Dave Selly and also from uh, Paul Ensbo. Uh, with each plot, uh, various uh, sets of data from across the Central African Copper Belt and both ultimately show a similar story where fluids from many of the, the classical Copper Belt deposits show a highly uh, evaporated or residual brine signature down here. Um, whereas fluids from deposits which are demonstrably later in basin history, for example, Kansanchi and, and certainly Kapushi, they show much higher chlorine bromine ratios, um, as I say, consistent with, with some component from uh, the dissolution of, of uh, evaporite deposits. So if we have a look at some of these fluids in transmitted light, what do they look like and how do they differ from one another? Um, again, here, you know, I don't really have time to go into the detail of each fluid inclusion assemblage um, recognized in the various vein types and, and split those down by deposit and everything. But these images just serve as an example of the, the diverse array of fluid inclusions uh, and their associated phase proportions in different vein types and different vein ages. Uh, one important association I, I would highlight is that at the Inkana, Mindola, and also the Inchanga deposits, uh, which might both be considered classical Zambian copper belt type deposits, um, primary inclusions posted within the same quartz or carbonate minerals as copper and cobalt sulfides um, in relatively early layer parallel veins typically show a variety of uh, multi-phase salt saturated primary inclusions. So for example, uh, images C and D here, whereas primary inclusions in discordance, so clearly um, post-kinematic veins are dominantly two-phase under-saturated inclusions, for example, in image F here, or sometimes just halite saturated, for example, uh, image B here. And those transmitted light images are supported by these SEM element intensity maps where you can see dried up inclusion cavities and uh, the solid daughter phases which uh, lie within those cavities and they're here colored by their composition. So here the, the key colors are, are green which is sodium and, and red which is potassium. And alongside chlorinity maps these essentially confirm that an awful lot of the primary inclusions hosted within kinematically uh, earlier veins, which also host mineralization, host a significant component of potassium, uh, as well as other bitten salt species. So those are all of these inclusions uh, on the left hand side here, so A through F. So focusing in a little bit more detail now, uh, I'll show a few results from just the Encarna Mindola deposit, which lies on the, the, the northeast the limb of the Encarna syncline within the Chambishi Basin. Uh, and that's located on the southwestern flank of the Kafui anticline, which is often considered kind of the classical Zambian copper belt. Uh, and clearly, um, Dave and uh, Kuhn both, both mentioned this deposit earlier this morning. So, so here I've split the fluid inclusion populations up a little bit more on, on the kind of basis of their interpreted relative age of the, of the host veins. So whether those are considered to have been in place prior to or, or after peak Lophilian orogenesis, and also on the basis of, of, of field relations. Um, and you can see that once the, the potassium chloride component of salinity is taken into account on the y-axis here in the form of total salinity, the purple points, uh, which represent the primary inclusions hosted by mineralized um, pre to syn kinematic veins, they show distinctly higher homogenization temperatures and salinities uh, than all of the later fluid types, whether, whether primary or secondary in origin. So I guess the take home message here uh, so far is, is the clear dichotomy in the, the temperature and salinity characteristics of what are shaping up to look like, you know, very potent solutions for the transport of various metal species in these earlier potassic brines relative to the, the still hot, um, but much lower salinity, later sodium chloride dominated solutions. And this distinction appears to hold true to some degree uh, when we look at the base metal concentrations of the different fluid types as well. 
Um, and these plots show the results of laser ablation of individual texturally constrained fluid inclusions uh, and the quantification of, of major and trace cations, including copper and cobalt in this instance. So here I've plotted uh, copper versus cobalt on the left and then copper versus potassium sodium ratio of individual inclusions in the right hand plot. Uh, note the log scale on the left hand plot. And I guess the first standout feature here is that these, uh, these high temperature and salinity earlier brines once again uh, sit out on their own when it comes to copper and cobalt endowment, um, which averaged kind of in the hundreds of, of ppm copper and then tens to low hundreds of ppm cobalt. Um, and although, you know, although both elements do show a fair amount of, of variability, they do clearly sit away from the later lower salinity solutions. Um, perhaps the most telling plot here, though, is, is the right hand plot. Um, where there appears to be a relationship between the potassium sodium ratio of an inclusion uh, and then its copper endowment. So if our if our dominant uh, ore fluid at this stage at this uh, sorry this deposit and and perhaps some other deposits in in the classical Zambian copper belt at least were unusually potassic brines, this begs the question, you know, how do you how do you form those brines? How do you generate that signature? And this brings us back to these plots, which I showed earlier, where we can look back at the halogen systematics data. And if you recall, the data compiled by uh, Dave Selly and, and others suggested that those fluids which are associated with um, stratiform copper cobalt mineralization in classical Zambian copper belt deposits. Um, they're interpreted, uh, sorry, the veins were interpreted um, early ages, relatively early ages, compared to peak Lophilian orogenesis. They displayed halogen ratios or signatures consistent with an evaporitic or a residual origin. Uh, and as I showed earlier, we know from experimental evidence of the evaporation of modern day seawater that if you were to tap a brine somewhere in this kind of um, this red window here with this, this red arrow, you'd effectively have a very dense residual brine with a potassium sodium ratio of around one uh, in this area of the plot here, a very high degrees of evaporation, um, which would not only form a very effective transport, metal transporting solution, but uh, which would also, you know, look very similar to those kind of high temperature potassic brines that, that I've shown in the last few slides. Of course, we should consider the other aspect of paleofluid compositions, which is, you know, their, their composi compositional um, evolution after their generation and as they interact with various lithologies within the basin. Um, and this, of course, is where they scavenge the metals, which we've seen are elevated in the earliest generations brines. Um, and so we must also consider that some proportion of the major cation chemistry of those brines would be attributed to fluid rock interactions uh, within the basin. So the left hand image here that just shows some petrographic evidence for these kind of processes in, in the form of the breakdown and replacement of primary to trital potassium feldspar and in, in this case in the football classic sequence at Nchanga. Um, and then once again I've grabbed, nabbed the, uh, the right hand image here from Dave Selly which shows how the dominant alteration assemblages um, are macroscopically partitioned across the basin. Uh, where the, the classical Congolese deposits towards the basin depth center, typically associated with, with magnesium mesosomatism. Um, whereas uh, those deposits in the kind of classical Zambian copper belt towards the southern basin margin, and then also Kamoa up towards the kind of north, northwestern basin margin, they're characterized by dominantly potassic mesosomatic assemblages. So this is, you know, this is clearly an area which requires a lot more work, but it does raise the possibility that in Zambia we're seeing the exhaust fluids derived from basin scale redistribution of, of primary alkali contents within the footwall plastic uh, reservoirs or sequences from the main depot center um, outwards towards the basin margins. So uh, this is just one final slide. Um, you know, I just wanted to highlight, of course, that um, the data I've shown here just from, from a single classical Zambian copper belt deposit um, and not a deposit recognized as having a significant contribution to mineralization from relatively late post-peak tectonic brines, uh, as is the case elsewhere, for example, at Kinsanchi. Um, and we should acknowledge the huge diversity of deposit types and metal associations 
that are present across the whole Copper Belt. Um, and this brings me, I guess, onto a broader point, which is that at different points in, in basin history, predominant fluid regimes will change and, and evolve. And I think we should get our heads around the fact that it is geologically reasonable for a basin brine to be resident in an interior depocenter for tens um, or even hundreds of millions of years. And for derivatives of that fluid to be tapped at different points in a prolonged history and potentially by different geodynamic triggers. In effect, you know, I guess we should be cognizant that, um, that when taken in unison um, and on a basin wide scale, much of the fluid inclusion work, the, the geochronology, and most importantly, the, the textual evidence in the field are permissive of a wide range of mineralization ages uh, and events spanning tens, if not hundreds of millions of years. And perhaps ultimately we don't want a single kind of model or a single mineralization event fits all kind of basin. Um, you know, perhaps those basins don't, don't produce the supergiant metallogenic districts. So uh, with that, I'll leave it there and uh, look forward to a bit of discussion afterwards. Awesome. Thanks for that, James. Uh, uh, you've already shot, uh, stopped sharing the screen. So uh, Philip, would you like to share your screen? And before uh, we get into that, I will just introduce the next speaker. So. Philip Moucher is a professor at KU Leuven in Belgium and the current Dean of the Faculty of Science over there. Philip leads the research unit for ore geology and geofluids, research in stratiform copper cobalt deposits, pegmatite hosted deposits and tin tungsten occurrences across Central Africa and Europe. Philip, pos Philip possesses specialized expertise in stable isotope geochemistry, fluid occlusion analysis, and of course, geological interpretation, and has published several well-cited publications in the subject area and across the Central African Copper Belt, which you'll be talking about right now. So over to you, Philip. Okay, um, thanks very much, Jamie, for the nice introduction. Uh, can you see my presentation? Uh, yes. Okay, can you see also this pencil? Yep. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, Thanks also to, to James for um, giving a nice overview of the fluid inclusion work in, in Zambia. And actually you will see uh, confirmation uh, of the work uh, he carried out in Zambia here uh, in this talk, focusing mainly on the um, Congolese copper belt, but I will also show some examples of the uh, Zambian copper belt. Um, it's my name on it, but actually it's the result of many colleagues who contributed, postdocs, uh, PhD students and master students, and um, thanks to them um, that I could give this overview talk. Okay. Um, so in this uh, next slide, you can see the overview of the um, copper belt ranging from Ankana in Zambia over the Louis Swishi. Uh, mine, um, Kambove, Tengifungurume, up to Kamoto, and I will discuss um, these uh, deposits in um, this presentation. Um, one very nice example showing uh, the mineralization is this slab here, which consists of a, a laminated um, microbial carbonate, sometimes shaley, um, deposited in a, a subtidal environment ranging between the subtidal and supertidal. And you can also see here the um, nodules after evaporites, which um, which consist of anhydride and are nicely replaced by here um, chalcopyrite and also bornite. In the thin section here below, you can see um, catalyte um, present in uh, the nodule and replacing the anhydride, but also the fine grained quartz and fine grained dolomite. We studied the um, fluid inclusions in, in this fine grain quartz, and, and thanks to uh, Stan Noal and then Hamdi al because it is a uh, painstaking uh, work studying these fluid inclusion with a maximum size of five micrometers. And these fluid inclusions consist of a liquid phase and a vapor phase, and the salinity ranges between um, about 10 and 20 equivalent weight percent sodium chloride. 
and the homogenization temperature varies between 100 and 220 degrees Celsius. Um, we also analyzed the sulfurized top composition of the different sulfides in the um, anhydride, well, in, in the nodules replacing the anhydrides. And the sulfurized atomic composition of the sulfides varies between plus 10 and minus 16. The sulfurized atomic composition of the neoproterozoic marine seawater is around 17 uh, per mil and is confirmed here by the um, sulfur uh, isotopic analysis of anhydride in um, the copper belt. So we have uh, fractionation of the sulfurized top composition ranging between seven up to um, 33 uh, per mil. Such large variation can be explained by bacterial sulfate reduction. And bacterial sulfate reduction takes place at temperatures below 80 degrees Celsius. In addition to um, the mineralization occurring in the um, rocks disseminated and also in uh, tiny veins and in nodules. Um, we have the brecciation of um, these fragments of the rocks. And you can see here an example of a fragment. The fragments range in size from um, less than a centimeter up to a decimeter, meter, meter, several tens of meters and even hundred meters uh, in size. Uh, in the, especially the DRC. The fragments have been cemented by uh, coarse grained quartz and dolomite, but also are, are mineralized and mineralization can be uh, quite severe. Here in the in section below, you have an example of the quartz, the dolomite, and also of the opaque minerals, such as chalcopyrite. These are crystals uh, with a size of more than a millimeter. This is an example from um, the DRC. This is an example of um, the PhD of Kuhn Tormans um, and the master thesis of Dieter Brems, showing uh, a slab from the Entkana deposit with a clear concentration of, of chalcopyrite in the hinge zone of the fold. So clearly, synergenic mineralization taking place here. Um, of course, we also studied the fluid inclusions in these large dolomite and quartz crystals. And as uh, been uh, illustrated already by James, we can find fluid inclusions up to three solids, um, halide, um, sulfide, and anhydride, in addition to the vapor bubble. So clearly different fluid inclusions from the ones I've shown you before. Um, Hamdi al in his PhD studied these um, fluid inclusions, and the inclusions are characterized by a much higher salinity, ranging between 35 and 45 equivalent uh, weight percent sodium chloride, exactly what uh, Jamie has shown us uh, in his slide. And also, again, a similar range in temperature with a minimum of around 270 degrees Celsius. So this is a second different type of fluid which migrated through the subsurface and causing the mineralization. We also analyzed the, from the latter type of fluid inclusions, the uh, anion and cation composition. And this graph is showing the results um, of chloride and bromide. And I will only discuss the um, example of the analysis of Louis Fischi. I won't discuss the Kipushi, it's a different story. Um, on this graph, you can see the seawater evaporation trajectory with here the saturation halide, the precipitation of halide. And on this plot, the analysis plot above the seawater evaporation uh, trajectory. This indicates that this type of fluid is the result from the evaporation of seawater, is the first process, followed by the dissolution of halide at a higher temperature. And indeed, the temperature of these fluids is ranging uh, between 270 degrees Celsius up to 400 degrees Celsius. So it's in correspondence what James has said, 
we have firstly this evaporation, the brines are forming, and subsequently in these um, late synergenic mineralizations, we have the dissolution of the sodium chloride in the subsurface. We also uh, analyzed the uh, individual fluid inclusions by laser ablation ICPMS in addition to the crush leach analysis. And in this diagram, with on the vertical axis the concentration and on the horizontal the different elements, we can see uh, the, or we can compare the analysis from the crush leach here with its um, triangles compared here with the um, analysis of laser ablation. And you can see, although we are analyzing individual inclusions, yeah, compared to bullet rock analysis, these data um, are really comparable with regard to the sodium, calcium, potassium, uh, and um, magnesium lithium content. Also interesting and confirming what has been said before, the concentration of the metals in these fluids is extremely high. Here we have the copper content, 2000 ppm cobalt, also again at 800 ppm, but also high concentrations in zinc. And look here at uh, the barium content uh, up to 3000 to 3, ppm, also clearly indicating um, that um, barium was uh, nicely transported in this fluid. Um, this slide shows the results of a four year PhD um, carried out by Jorik van Wilderode. And he studied the strontium and neodymium isotope composition of all possible source rocks in uh, the copper belt and compared the results of that study with the strontium and neodymium isotopic composition of the carbonates. And he, based on his uh, PhD, he concluded that um, the mineralizing fluids um, certainly interacted with local felsic basement. And you can see here the very high um, strontium isotopic values. These results were also confirmed by earlier studies on the lead isotopes in the Zambian copper belt. But we also see that there is um, a relationship with the host rocks, indicating that also interaction with the host rocks was important um, in the copper belt. And also for specific cases, we could show the involvement of the mafic rocks. Um, studies we carried out uh, more recently, um, meaning uh, the last uh, five years, is studying actually the um, late to post orogenic uh, fluid flow. And also this fluid flow could be associated with um, mineralization, but which is minor. And uh, these are the results from a few master theses, and especially um, the results of the current PhD of Pascal Mambwe. And in this graph, you can see on the vertical axis the salinity, an equivalent to 8% sodium chloride, and on the horizontal axis the homogenization temperature. And you can see first large um, range in homogenization temperature for this high salinity fluid, ranging from 250 degrees Celsius up to 70, 80 degrees Celsius, clearly showing the cooling of this high salinity fluid um, after the maximum uh, burial, after the post orogenic mineralization. The second uh, uh, fluid you can see in this graph is the mixing of this high salinity fluid between a temperature of 200 degrees and even 50 degrees Celsius, but a very low saline fluid um, up to a salinity of even less than the salinity of seawater, indicating a mixing of the high salinity fluid with the meteoric uh, fluid, which um, penetrated the subsurface after um, starting during, during the thrusting and uplift of the area. So in a conclusion, uh, based on these results, we could um, distinguish at least four main hypogene fluids, a low to intermediate temperature fluid um, with an intermediate salinity, which has a diagenetic hydrothermal origin, followed by a high temperature, high salinity fluid 
which is a late diagenetic to synergenic fluid. Then we have a high salinity fluid with a wide range in temperature, which is a late postorogenic uh, fluid. And that fluid mixed with um, a low salinity in turbo to be a meteoric uh, water. Based on the results I've shown, the syn to postorogenic brines originated from the evaporation of seawater and the dissolution of, of evaporites at high temperature in the deepest subsurface. The study of the um, strontium and iodinum isotopes suggests that, uh, well, the, that the uh, metals originated from the interaction with the felsic basement, mafic rocks, or rowan rocks. The brines show this enrichment in metals, and the sulfur originates from seawater sulfate. Something which I didn't show you was um, primordial pyrite, uh, early pyrite, which is quite important in the mineralization. And then also um, the reduction of the evaporites, specifically the anhydrite nodules, the major source also for sulfur. And the reduction was induced uh, by bacterial sulfate reduction, but also by thermochemical sulfate reduction at higher temperature. And I will be happy to answer questions after uh, the presentation of Nicolas. Awesome, thanks, Philippe. That was really good. Um, lots of work in there. So our final presenter today is gonna to be Nicholas Santelan. Um, if you wanna load up your slides, Nicholas, and I'll give you a brief introduction so that everybody knows exactly who you are. So our final presenter today is Dr. Nicholas Santelan, who completed his PhD in 2015 at the University of Geneva having spent time before that in industry with Bolidon in Sweden. And following the completion of this, Nick received two postdoctoral grants, essentially to receive specialist training to master the analytically challenging rhenium-osmium isotope system, which has been used extensively throughout the Copper Belt. Um, firstly at the University of Alberta with uh, Professor Robert Creaser, and then at Durham University in the UK with Professor Dave Selby. Nicholas has since set up a state-of-the-art rhenium osmium facility at ETA Zurich in Switzerland, and is a rising specialist in the field of rhenium osmium um, geo uh, geochronology, publishing new rhenium osmium data across multiple ore systems, including that within the Central African Copper Belt, which is what he's gonna present now. So over to you, Nicholas. Thank you very, very much for that very nice introduction. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so I'm very happy to, to have been asked to to give you an overview of uh, what, uh, as uh, Jamie rightly uh, presented as an analytically challenging uh, system uh, can bring in terms of uh, great outcome so that we can help uh, geologists uh, with a handful experience in, for example, the Central African Copper Belt, but uh, other places like Alaska and so on, to understand the origin of these uh, copper cobalt uh, sediment hosted uh, mineral deposits. And by the way, sediment hosted mineral deposits are the most fascinating uh, uh, all deposits, I think, and then I can have uh, an, an argument with all the porphyry uh, dudes uh, in the audience later. Having said that, uh, more seriously, so copper cobalt sulfide rhenium most from geochronology, what it takes and what it brings. First of all, what it takes, and that I have to acknowledge, you know, the the support from the industry because without the industry, we, we wouldn't be able to to get these fantastic samples from which we can decipher the history of and uh, carry out uh, sulfide geochronology. So it takes to actually get these uh, exceptional samples, uh, uh, ex um, examples of which you have on, on the screen at the moment from a different uh, deposit. Uh, it's not from the Central African Copper Belt, but you know, accessing samples from the Central African Copper Belt relies on either academic uh, collaborators, museum like in Belgium, and I thank uh, Steen de Vele for that, or uh, industry partners. So it takes to be able to actually uh, separate out these um, different sulfides that you, uh, you can see coexist in these samples because what rhenium osmium sulfide geochronology really is, is a technique that enables you, thanks to a really demanding protocol to uh, decipher the rhenium osmium systematics of individual sulfide species. And I really insist on that, that we don't, do not work with mixtures because just like you might uh, carry out zircon, badilite, uh, monazite, uranium, lead, geochronology, you do that in a mineral specific manners. 
And just like we do for sulfides, we separate boronite, chalcopyrite, and carolite from one another, and we produce uh, pure mineral separates that I will explain uh, later on how we do that. And then we carry out the uh, analytic challenging, analytically challenging uh, procedures of isotope, uh, renium osmium isotope geochemistry. We use negative thermal ionization mass spectrometry to get uh, rhenium and osmium uh, isotopic composition separately, and then we reduce the data. And hopefully we can, um, having followed this demanding uh, work uh, we, and procedures, we can uh, obtain reliable rhenium uh data that we can convert into a date. And then rhenium osmium uh, date only becomes an age if it makes sense by being weighed against uh, geological evidence that, for example, James or Philip presented earlier. And we can then piece together, together um, you know, geochronological evidence that can support and um, develop further the models uh, presented by predecessors. So what I usually tell, tell the students for sediment-hosted uh, mineral deposit, you need to document uh, these four parameters in order to be able to uh, down the line in a conclusion present a reliable model. You need to know where your metal come from, your metals come from, sorry. Then you need to know the source of the, of the fluids, and we've heard about that uh, through the two uh, previous presentations. And because these, these fluids are going to be your, 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 your carrier, uh, your, what conveys and brings your metals to the site of mineralization. And at the site of mineralization, you, you need to have a reducing agent that can fix these metals uh, in, in form of sulfides as the solubility of metals uh, actually drops and you can fix them as a copper cobalt or copper sulfides only. And then you need a geodynamic engine or several geodynamic engines that can actually make the fluid moves, uh, move and uh, eventually uh, contribute to mineralization. And uh, that's the point. And um, as James rightly said, you know, these can happen through uh, several uh, geodynamic um, uh, setting and events throughout the evolution of a uh, metallogenic province. And this really depends on the evolution uh, of Earth as, as a whole and through the, the segregation of the various envelopes uh, through geological time. And especially uh, what is striking in the Central African Copper Belt, you have to bear in mind that there was a snowball Earth right uh, during the development of the basin. So what is the role of the snowball Earth during uh, the, the, the genesis of the Central African Copper Belt? And can the snowball Earth uh, explain the exceptional endowment that uh, we have in the Central African Copper Belt. That's something I won't tackle today, but this is uh, clearly something that people in the, this part of the world should look at. And the way we can actually uh, piece together the, all this information and propose a refined genetic model is by providing the, uh, the specialist in, in, specialists in the, in the area with the absolute geochronology of the ore minerals being sulfides, but we can also work with sulfarsenides, typically arsenopyrite, or arsenides like the cobalt arsenides and nickel arsenides, but these are present in, in this area. So what is rhenium osmium isotope geochemistry about? Well, osmium, as you can see from this uh, uh, like screenshot of the periodic table, belongs to the platinum group elements. And together with the rhenium and gold, this, uh, these elements form the highly siderophile element family. So they not, on, not only love iron, but they also love um, so, um, sulfur. And for rhenium and osmium, beyond that, they also love, uh, love organic matter. So rhenium-187, which is one of the two isotopes of rhenium, decays isobarically into 187 osmium. And you have to bear in mind that rhenium osmium is a very long lead dating scheme the, because the half-life is uh, close to 42 billion years. Uh, put, put in simple words, it's basically uh, a long lead dating, dating scheme that is really well suited to date uh, geological events in, uh, in deep time. Uh, so we play around with two isotopes of rhenium and osmium has a larger family with seven isotopes, which is uh, the uh, rationale behind uh, us being able to actually decipher the rhenium osmium systematics of, of minerals using these uh, rhenium osmium schemes. One critical uh, aspect 
and fantastic properties of rhenium versus osmium is that osmium is highly compatible during mantle melting and rhenium is mildly incompatible. What it means in terms of uh, crystal differentiation is that uh, when you generate a magma, you have, uh, this magma will have a high rhenium to osmium ratio. And down the line, when you actually generate continental crust through, through uh, the time, then that crust would get high rhenium to osmium ratio. And through the decay of rhenium into osmium, then you accumulate what we call radiogenic 187 osmium in the crust, contrary to a depleted mantle in rhenium. And therefore you have a dichotomy between mantle and crust with high, what we called 187 uh, osmium over 188 osmium ratios in the crust in the order of 0.3, but you can have up to 10,000 for single sulfides. Uh, conversely, uh, you have very low um, uh, equivalent to isotopic ratios of osmium in the mantle at any given time in Earth history. Why do we care? Is because when I will introduce later the, the term isochrone age, you have a uh, intersection with your y-axis in an isochrone diagram, and then you get the osmium isotopic composition at the initial time when the sulfide precipitated. And what is very important is that osmium is a metal. So therefore you have a dating scheme involving two metals and one of these metal is a powerful tracer to your potential source of metals and this is osmium. And then we can use this initial ratio of osmium to track down the metal source. This is very, very powerful. So to, to clear a bit the, the scene, uh, because uh, through interaction at conferences or even reading papers, I know that uh, two words are highly, um, I mean, sadly, not well understood by the, the, the large audience. And uh, they are, sometimes they are used for one another and it doesn't mean anything. So you might hear the words modal ages and isochrone ages. So put in simple words, uh, for example, if you take the, the, the two minerals, molybdenite and most arsenopyrite, in these minerals, the osmium that you will measure is only osmium that is provided by the decay of rhenium once the mineral has closed uh, its uh, crystal structure and rhenium has started to decay into osmium. There is no what we call common osmium, that uh, is osmium that may be present in the environment at the time of mineral precipitation that is incorporated in molybdenite. So all the all osmium in molybdenite or arsenopyrite for that matter is radiogenic. Therefore, you can uh, um, calculate an age directly from the total osmium content that you measure in molybdenite and the total 187 rhenium content that you measure in molybdenite, and then you get an, an age. This is a modal age. You usually duplicate these ages to confirm them, and you get a nice weighted average uh, of these ages. It's highly precise because uh, molybdenite and some arsenopyrite concentrate rhenium and osmium to ppm to sub ppm levels. And um, this is why uh, molybdenite ages are highly precise. For most other uh, sulfides and the ones that we are interested in today, being namely bornite and uh, kaolite, uh, 187 osmium is only one portion of the total osmium content. And the rest is common osmium. As I said, any isotope of osmium that was available in the environment of mineral precipitation, and then which is incorporated in the sulfide at the time of precipitation. And then for these uh, sulfides to be able to bring you uh, a reliable rhenium osmium ages, you need to work with a sample set of six to seven samples usually, and you, uh, and you analyze uh, each sample for uh, each sulfide in each sample, uh, one, two, even three times if you need to repeat your analysis, and eventually you can get a statistical regression line like this, which is um, the slope of which is related to the age of the mineral. So the slope of the, of the what we call the isochrone line will uh, give you a date and the intersection in this 187, 188 versus 187 rhenium over 188 osmium diagram will give you this, what we call the initial ratio of osmium. So this is a highly powerful diagram as well because we not only get an H, but we get also the isotopic composition of osmium at the initial time that we can use to track down the source of metals. And bear in mind that uh, we work most of the time with 
PPB, but most of the time PPT levels of cranium and osmium. This is why uh, this is extremely analytically challenging, and we use uh, TIMS uh, thermal analyzation mass spectrometry for, for that matter. And one thing I will heavily insist on is that your MSWD, which is usually a term that is not really well understood nor respected uh, by many people, should be below one or close to one for reasons I can uh, explain later if people want. So again, so we start with a, with, a, with the sample set in with having the, mac the macroscopic samples here that were provided by the Steen de Velo in, in Belgium. And you can have stratiform mirrorization, you can have evaporite breccia in which you have carolite and bornite. And the, the first step is really to go through your paragenetic sequences in high details so that you actually identify, okay, I have a carolite with a ream of chalcosite and I have bornite there and so on. That gives you the first order indication how you, you need to process your samples to actually uh, down the line separate carolite from bornite so that you avoid having mixtures because analyzing mixtures of sulfides will lead, lead you nowhere and will bring you non-usable data. And this is uh, the, the protocol that uh, we go through and we introduced and published uh, last year, even though it has been uh, uh, in a, I mean, followed in our group for, for, for years and we steadily improved on each step. So we, for each sample, uh, we start by cleaning the bulk sample and then this, uh, this sample is hammered. Uh, any metal shards is removed by a magnet and then it is, uh, it is um, uh, processed in a shutter box so that uh, we can crush the sample, sieve uh, uh, in sequence, and then you get down to a 70 to 200 mesh fraction of uh, bulk material in which you have your fragments of bornite, your fragments of carolite, and any other ganglion as a fragment. And then the, the critical part and, and the fun part in, in a way is for you to be able to process your bulk sample in sequence uh, used, uh, using a France isodynamic magnetic separator in a stepwise manner. And in that sense, you actually use the magnetic properties of the sulfides to be able to separate them sequentially. So you start with, with, the, with the lower um, uh, M current so that bornite will uh, elapse in the, in the first more magnetic fraction at the lower current. And then you are one bornite, once bornite is out, you are left with a with a pre uh, first treatment of your bulk material in which you have carolite, and then later you treat the that fraction uh, that was not magnetic up to 1.1 amp current, and you uh, apply a current of 1.7 amp, and then the carolite. Uh, will elapse in the magnetic fraction at 1.7 uh, amperons. But then both uh, the bornite mineral separate and carolite mineral separate still bear uh, gang minerals that might uh, have stuck uh, through uh, you know, um, statics on, on that. So you, you make a fine tuned cleaning of the mineral separates by heavy liquid mineral separation. And then you get potentially 100% carolite mineral separate and a bornite mineral separate. But you, we don't stop here. What we do is that we make a quality, uh, say a quality control of our mineral separates by mounting a fraction of each of these uh, uh, aliquots of mineral separates in, in epoxy. And then we polish these and we uh, look at them in reflective microscopy. And if needed, we use the ESCM and electron microbook to control that we only have bornite in one mineral separate and carolite in the other. If not, we go back to mineral separation until we get 100% of each in the mineral separates. And then it's ready for random optimized temperature chemistry. So we chose to focus on, on Kamoto in the Congolese copper belt because it, this is one of the least deformed uh, mineral deposit that we knew of in, in that part of the world. Uh, we didn't want to introduce a, additional complexity with metamorphism and so on. So we used uh, Kamoto as a prime example. So Kamoto is here in the north uh, western part of the Central African Copper Belt in the in right. And as a starter for, for us uh, before the work, we had these 
a collection of uh, radio master images of molybdenite produced by C. Leto et al. in 2015, 2017. Uh, and this molybdenite was uh, always associated in each deposit, uh, according to these authors, with uh, copper mineralization. So you've got uh, two uh, outstanding uh, periods of mineralization, potentially, in the, in the Cambrian and the, the, the Ordopician. Um, at 525 uh, and to 512 million years as the green diamonds and a bit younger at 505 to 490. And one striking uh, presence was copper mineralization in basement rocks with the mesoproterozoic age. And then in our study, we produced, uh, so we worked on these, as I, see, as I showed you, this evaporated breccia bearing bornite and carolite. Uh, the stratiform ores uh, in the upper and lower bodies, and then the bornite, which was uh, present in each of these uh, uh, mineralized species. So the results are as follows. So for the carolite here in the evaporated breccia, we got a very nice uh, isochrone uh, age uh, date, sorry, but, and then at 609 plus or minus five uh, with, a, with a high, very high uh, initial ratio of osmium and MSWD, which is really high, uh, acceptable at 1.6. Um, this is, your MSWD is directly tied to the precision of your age and your initial ratio of osmium. So this is an age in the adiacaran and the osmium isotopic ratio being that, high, meaning radiogenic, meaning that you, we are dealing with a source of osmium which must be really old, or for, 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 for osmium to have been able to accumulate in this, that source, or a source which is young and which is loaded with uranium. So we'll see later what, what it means. And uh, for, for your records, so we, we had about 130 to 250 uh, PPB uranium and almost uh, one PPB osmium, which was exceptionally high for us for, for that. For bornite, which was common to the uh, stratiform mineralization and evaporated breccia, we got a much younger age with again, a very nice MSWD and a much more, I mean, a much lower and what we call juvenile uh, osmium isotopic ratios. So we are here in the uh, lower uh, order vision and this uh, highly juvenile um, uh, osmium isotopic ratio points to a potential uh, crust derivation, but very close to the, uh, to the mantle source for osmium. So the take home message, uh, what I've done here, I've, I've taken a figure from, uh, from Stilito et al in which they were uh, summarizing the uh, timing of uh, sedimentation, magmatism, uh, orogeny, and putting uh, on, on top of that the timing of the copper mineralization in the Zambian copper belt, thanks to their molybdenite ages. And I, I've plotted our three ages coming from uh, our 2018 study. So the carolite -like mineralization would coincide with the timing when you have a transition from the sedimentation in the Katanga basin to a synorogenic sedimentation. And to me, that would make sense that you, you start having the, the Luffian orogeny, uh, like the, the geodynamic motion put, uh, make, um, sorry, the geodynamic aging putting the fluids into motion and eventually leading to mineralization of, of carolite. And remember the very high uh, osmium isotopic ratio at 3.2 would be co highly compatible with derivation of osmium from the basement as Philip uh, uh, showed using uh, independent geochemical evidence, and why not deri der uh, deriving uh, copper also from this uh, mineralization in the mesoproterozoic basement as uh, shown by Cilito et al. in 2017. Conversely, the, the bornite mineralization in, in the Ordovician in the foreland could be compatible with, a, with a, we know there are multiple uh, cyanide intrusions, uh, and I read last year there were cyanide intrusions in the, in the Zambian copper belt. And I'm not saying that at all that copper uh, was, you know, is, is magmatic in origin. It's just that the, the cyanide could have triggered uh, the heat flow 
uh, that could have uh, put the fluids again into motion and probably uh, contributed uh, bornite mineralization in, in that area. And I don't have the time to, to, uh, to detail the mineralization in the stratiform um, upper and lower or, or bodies at Kamoto, but they kind of overlap with the timing of uh, orogenic deformation in the Lophilia and orogeny, and also overlap with the with the copper mineralization on the Zambian side of the copper belt. And you can nicely see that uh, basically there's, there's a, an evolution from a, a cobalt rich phase uh, in the Ejakaran and gradually evolving to a copper only phase in, in the Ordovician. Uh, that's a uh, food for discussion later on. For that, I'd like to thank you for your for your attention and interest. And of course, I thank the Swiss National Science Foundation for the steady support I've received. Super. Thank you very much, Nicholas. Um, so that brings us to the end of the talks. And now the discussion is essentially open to everybody. So in the chat, we've got essentially all the instructions needed to ask questions, uh, but I'll, I'll kind of just briefly go over them. Essentially, if you want to ask your question yourself by being unmuted, you can just type the question in the chat and we'll ask you to unmute yourself. If you want one of us to ask it, me or Philippa, you can put host slash and then the question and we will read it out, or you can even just direct message us. Um, but until, so we do have a couple of questions coming in, but uh, just like this morning, um, if any of you who have spoken would like to talk a little about uh, a little bit about ask questions to one of each other, maybe James to Nicholas or Nicholas to Philippe, by all means start with that and then we'll start putting some questions from the audience. Okay, Jamie, James, maybe we can uh, start uh, seeing the question from the audience. Is that okay? Yeah, that is absolutely fine. Okay, so. The first question has come in from a lady called Maria. So if Maria, you'd like to unmute yourself, you can ask your question, which I think you're asking Nicholas. Hi, uh, yes. Thank you very much for all the presentations. Very interesting. My question is, if in your sample via um, SEM characterization, you've seen exolution or replacement features, then does this mean that such sulfides cannot be used for this rheum osmium uh, methodology or is there a workaround for this type of, of sampling? Thank you. Well, yeah, uh, if I see a solution of another phase in uh, let's like say bornite and so on, I'll be highly suspicious to, to know what uh, I'll be dating, but if, an ex, if it's an ex-solution, let's say that uh, you have a solid solution potentially between bornite and, you know, impurities in bornite that we know of and that eventually exsolve, uh, basically they belong to the, the you know, the, the, the same pool of metals that may be formed at the same time. Uh, so that could be uh, potentially the, the same event that you will be dating uh you can't you, we can't separate the solutions from uh from from bornite itself it's a, it's a bulk technique uh but i'll try to avoid such samples because i would have seen that in the uh in the extensive um, paragenetic studies that we carry out uh in, in the in the samples and as for replacement what do you mean by replacement by supergenes uh i mean supergene alteration or later hypogene alteration? Um, I would say generally in either case, um, particularly some samples that I've seen show um, pyrite being replaced by chalcopyrite. But yeah. uh, the question is, I guess, more broadly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, as, as you could see in my talk, I mean, uh, bornite and, uh, was locally replaced by chalcocyte. But by, by following the, the protocol of the mineral separation that we, we, we implemented, basically your, your, what happens is that when bornite is replaced by chalcocyte, the magnetic uh, response to the current in the front side of the dynamic separator changes. So the, if you have a composite grain of chalcocyte and bornite, 
it will uh, it will be less it will be less magnetic than uh, pure bornite, and this is usually usually what I, I fiddle around by uh, using. I can just tell you it's I use a hand current of 0.6 uh, amps, and, and all bornite comes out, and then the mixture of charcoal like bornite will uh, elapse in the 0.6 to 1.1 amp current uh, fraction. So there's a way around that, but it takes time. But it's worth it. Okay, thank you, Alessandra. Thank you, Nicholas. We have another question from Kuhn. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask the question? Yeah, sure, I, I can. Uh, thanks everyone for, for your talks. Um, yeah, so for, for James, I was just wondering, and um, I might have asked you that in the past, uh, but there are large differences in the cobalt content uh, especially in the in the early synergenic fluid inclusions, do you have, you know, is that important because everyone's looking for cobalt, and do you have any idea why? Uh, yeah, uh, well, that's the killer question, I guess. Um, in, in short, no. Um, I think just from, from from the data I collected, it was very mixed messages. Um, at the Incarna deposit, uh, there were. The cobalt contents of fluids from from different veins were um, quite variable, as you mentioned. Um, there was a distinction between quartz and dolomite hosted inclusions, which um, really needs, I think, looking into whether that's a real distinction or not, or just a quirk of the data. Um, whereas in Changa, um, where obviously the the ore itself, the tenor of the ore there is is decoupled. Um, with copper only mineralization in the lower oil body and, and copper cobalt in the upper oil body. Uh, it's the opposite story where um, there was no appreciable difference there in um, cobalt contents of um, kind of universally cobalt and copper enriched uh, early brines there. So, so there it looked more like a kind of a, a, a trap controlled um, system in terms of decoupling the, the copper from the co cobalt mineralization. So, yeah, I mean, in short, um, you know, it's a usual story, need more data. I think really, really, we need to look into this in, in some of the more um, cobalt rich and certainly cobalt kind of dominant um, deposits further north. Thanks. Okay, so uh, the next question I think is for us to read out to you. Um, it's actually, I think, a, a repeated question from this morning's session. Um, so it's from uh, uh, Haluk, um, and he says, are there any uh, geochemical differences, especially for pathfinder elements, during changing lithological units or along tectonic contacts? For example, are there any critical differences in elemental distribution of ore uh, zones or zones in sandstone, red bed contacts, tectonic contacts, or lateralization. So I think he's asking this broadly to the panel, but essentially, are there any real changes in specifically pathfinder elements he wants to know? I, I think between different lithological units or maybe even along some kind of contact. We are getting shaking heads. <laughs> so, um, Maybe one to follow up on how uh, there is contact information for the, uh, you know, throughout the, the talks, it might be worth you emailing and they can kind of do a little bit of digging, maybe. Um, so to that uh, end. Jamie, Jamie, I can comment on it. Um, I'll go on. Yeah, there's, to my knowledge, there's, there's no, there are no really um, distinct pathfinder uh, elements in, in, um, in the copper belt. Um, there have been as has been explained, there is an intense alteration. Eh? You've got the potassium alteration, which can be identified. Um, we got the, um, in the copper belt also, the, the magnesium alteration with magnesite and so on. But um, as we've shown, Jamie, James and myself, the, the fluid flow is so widespread um, that um, it's not really um, focused on, on, on a specific um, ore deposit uh, by tracing fluids and alteration and so on. I, yeah, I just I completely agree. I just add to that that you know I think um, the key is going to be given the, the pervasiveness of that alteration. Um, I guess the key is going to be integrating 
you know, the alteration studies with, with also structural studies, more localized structural studies. Uh, and then obviously marrying that up with the, the fluid inclusion work that various people have been doing. Um, I think if you, if you can integrate the fluid geochemistry, the alteration, and then how that relates to local structures and, you know, um, this this obviously goes back to to Dave Sally saw this morning on hydrological kind of compartmentalization of the basin. Um, you know, although it's not you know pathfinder elements per se, it would be a I think it would be a good start in terms of uh, localizing you know exploration regions. Awesome. Um, thank you for asking that. Um, so the next question is from, I really apologize if I butchered his name, uh, Munshat Zimba. And this is for Nicholas. He says, any comments on resetting of the rhenium osmium dating system? Sorry, I kind of asked by unmuting. So uh, just basically, um, uh, yeah, any comments on just resetting, probably via metamorphism or, or any other process? Yeah, so we, we studied the, um, we have, fair amount of, of uh, evidence now that uh, most um, sulfides, including bornite and kaolite, it's not published yet um, for these, but for arsenopyrite and pyrite, the rhenium osmium systematics are remain pristine. Um, I mean, the closure temperature should be at about 450 uh, degrees. That's a minimum and conservative uh, number. But we know that uh, arsenopyrite, for example, uh, has rhenium osmium systematic that survives up to 550 degrees. Um, so for bornite, what I know is that if you don't go above 450 degrees, um, the, the rhenium osmium systematics remain, remain intact. And uh, it survives uh, uh, green schist metamorphism as well. And uh, yes, that's that would be my, my answer. Uh, for pyrite and arsenopyrite, uh, it's the uh, pyrite is a bit more complicated, but arsenopyrite survives uh, even up to amphibolite species. And molybdenite is, is is fantastic because you you will preserve your pristine uh, agent formation in molybdenite up to granulite species. It doesn't melt, so it's, it's quite remarkable. No, of course. That, that's a really important point, actually, because people uh, need to, I think if we haven't explained already, the there is a quite a, a decent degree of metamorphism across the Central African copper. It ranges kind of from, it's certainly in Zambia, a, a green schist up to amphibolite. Um, and then a little bit into the DRC, it goes lower, it goes sub-green schist. So it is important that you find essentially minerals that are going to survive those sorts of conditions, which is what Nick yes. touched on. And to, to make our, I was, as I said in the, in the introduction, when, uh, why we chose Kamoto is, was the reason that the, 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 the metamorphic grade was basically subgrange schist metamorphism. And uh, so we wanted to make our life easy so, and make a proper mm. study in an area where we knew the metamorphic overprint would be absent to minimal. Yeah. And, and, and you know, this is, this is a very good time to bring this up. Okay. Cause um, I was going to ask a few questions myself. So, um, I think Komoto was a good choice because of the absence of metamorphism. You, I mean, this is just a question in general to all three of you. Um, obviously, there's a bit of a, shall we say, a, a dating controversy in the uh, cough belt. Um, this idea that we have, I suppose, this pure kind of synorogenic timing versus potentially an earlier introduction via diagenesis, but the diagenetic ages are, are, are somewhat ambiguous. Do you believe the key? Um, for maybe potentially finding if present the, uh, a diagenetic age is more within the DRC because of the lower metamorphism. Yeah, so first a, a comment if I, uh, we clearly said in 2018, can you hear me guys? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we clearly said in 2018 that uh, we didn't find in the samples that we analyzed evidence for their genetic age. We didn't say that there, there's no their genetic it's in the sample that we analyzed. We, show, we see no evidence for the, their genetic age, first of all. Um, second of all, the, what, what I was really pleased about when I read the Dave Sally's uh, most recent publication is that the gradually people go away from that uh, their genetic 
date by Barra et al, uh, which has never been published. Uh, and I can say without uh, getting into um, too many details that we had discussion, Rob Kreiser, Dave Selby and myself with, with, with Barra, and uh, we, we looked at the data and we can't reproduce the, the date that uh, the Barra et al uh, data set uh, gives. And the data, Barra et al data set is highly problematic. They, you like uh, key, uh, key information in the Rainier Marsman data to be able to, to compute these in, in, with proper ellipse of errors and, and to propagate errors. So therefore, we cannot reproduce these. And uh, I mean, the, the disagreement and the controversy with, with Barra uh, uh, has been settled. And I don't think people should, uh, should, should discuss further that, you know, it's, uh, mm. it's settled. But um, what, having said that, the other point uh, before Philip, I think, uh, wants to say something which is logical. Um, I insist on the fact that to our knowledge, with the samples that we analyzed, we find no evidence for diagenetic age. It doesn't say that there's no diagenetic mineralization yet to be discovered and to be confirmed by um, by um, by uranium osmium further uranium osmium work that I think people will undertake. And uh, one last point is that um, maybe uh, uh, you know that the uh, I think there's a, there's an upper limit for diagenetic ages that would be 727 million years with the position of the grand conglomerate. Like the work, I mean, my, my pal Alan Rooney did uh, for the, you know, uh, look, looking at the Sturgeon and the Marino and Snowball Earth, uh, that puts really uh, an upper limit on the, on the ages. So uh, if, um, you know, ages for diagenetic age should be older than 727, that would be my guess. And again, one last point, uh, if people want to look at the gen genetic uh, age question, think about the impact of the snowball earth as well. You know, wh what I mean by this, the impact of that is that you, you have a gigantic basin with, as James explained, potentially evaporatic uh, brines accumulating in this basin for millions of years, and then you freeze an entire planet. So things stop, you know, you have, you have a, it's like in your freezer, you know, you put a, a sand bowl and you put water on that. No, water is not going to flow in your, in your, in your, in your, in your sand bowl anymore. So I think if, if people would tackle the Central African copper belt from the perspective of what happened to the, the fluid flow in the basin when the planet was frozen, uh, to be remarkable. And I think major discoveries would be made. And I, I've discussed that with Dave Broughton. And he said, be my guest, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Philippe, did you want to comment? Yeah, well, for, for regarding um, the dating, uh, we also published um, a paper on it, um, mostly focusing on, on the Shalkozite. And um, from that paper, it's clear that, that the Shalkozite is, is really a disaster. Um, so I think you can conclude that um, don't use the Shalkozite. Um, we didn't do details that, like, for example, people like uh, Hattishin is, is, is doing these days on, on the pyrite. And I think if you would do detailed analysis on, on, on that shell site, you would clearly see that you're dealing with, with uh, multiple generations of, of shell site on the one hand, and, and probably um, maybe also part of the resetting of the shell site. But I don't know the, 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 the close temperature of the shell site, but at least you would see several generations um also when the samples we saw we see even it's even sometimes difficult to make a distinction between the hypogene and the supergene um chalcosite um which is, is very abundant so my first point of of um of that paper is is that it clearly shows that don't use um the chalcosite um but it, it's the most abundant uh, mineral actually at, at uh, kamoto um that's why it's also so such a rich uh, or deposit. There is the other age, um, um, which was the best we could get, uh, which is, is a Bornite. And I think also um, that the colleagues um, um, who did the analysis are, are really keen that they, they only analyzed Bornite, but it, it was not like um, Nicolas says we didn't have a, a really nice um, isochron. It was just one um, age, and there were some. Um, uh, 
propositions made uh, regarding the initial initial um, content uh, present in, in the sample. But um, that's also clearly written in, in the paper, uh, what the assumptions were. And based on, on the assumptions and the dating, there was the age of, of 780 uh, million years. And I know um, this is one age, and um, this is certainly not uh, a strong age on the one hand. And on the other hand, it should uh, be confirmed by, by uh, new um, datings. Um, but I think the best evidence we have for, for an earlier mineralization is, is the work we presented, uh, which yeah, we presented already a long time ago, and I'll repeat it here, is um, the fact for the BSR, um, which is quite abundant. And so um, if you look at the complete metallogenetic model, you have to explain everything, um, not only the metals, but also the sulfur. And it's clear that the major sulfur store is the, is the framboil pyrite, which um, is several percentage in, in the rocks. Um, and in addition, also, the nodules and the anhydride present in, in the rocks is also uh, at the level of percentage. So this forms a really a major source of the sulfur. This is, is one point. Um, then the other thing is, is the, the temperature of, of um, 100 to 200 degrees Celsius, which were found in, in the quartz, which would correspond to a, a burial depth um, of yeah, three, four kilometer. And this is also what, what uh, we've heard to mo this morning, um, then you're in, in this convective cell uh, model, which Murray Hitzman already published it in 2010. Um, so, yeah, I think um, this, this deserves more, more analysis, more attention, as, as Nicola said, and um, focus on, on these examples where we uh, have the best evidence for, for um, the early digenetic, well, the hydrothermal digenetic mineralization. Um, I know that, that Murray, I, I don't think he's here, but um, we're still trying to date um, those samples, which we think are, are the best. Um, but yeah, let's see what the future brings. Cool. Um, Philippa, do we have any more questions? That are just in the wanna, if I can just react to, and I can confirm that uh, what uh, Philip just said, that we in the Spa Lake deposit, which is in the uh, in the belt basin in the in the USA, I conducted a radio mass isotopic systematics of uh, bornite charcoal site and charcoal pyrite in uh, in the same mineral deposit, and only only bornite and charcoal pyrite gave reliable ages, and charcoal site is all over the place, because as Philip said, uh, you can have super gene charcoal site, and that's uh, that's a major problem. And so the we, we suppose that the, the uh, closure temperature for radium and in charcoal site is extremely low, uh, below 200 degrees, maybe. So, so that's one. Okay, thank you. We have a couple of questions. If all of you are okay with more two or three questions, we can uh, go uh, with the questions. Are you okay, the three of you, Nicolas, Philip, and James? To two or three more questions? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, we have an anonymous question. Uh, and uh, it's for who wants to answer. So, what are your thoughts on the Lushwi, Lushwi Shi Dome? It is presented with a question mark between different metal and fluid signatures. Any thoughts on its fluid interaction with the rest of the belt and or perspective? Prospectivity. Any of you have any comment or thoughts about this? I think um, from from purely kind of a, a fluid geochemistry perspective, it's a particularly well probably one of the worst um, or least studied parts of the Zambian side of the belt. Um, I've looked at a few a few samples um, broadly from that area, and um, I, I think well, certainly they they were they were more magnesium than the more potassic signatures to further east, which I guess falls in line with that kind of transition over towards the the west towards the domes, um, and very very high temperature, very high salinities, so. 
Uh, I, but I think it's clearly, you know, that was just a handful of samples. And I think it's clearly um, clearly a window in the Zambian side of the basin, which is, which is in need of a lot more work uh, alongside pretty much, you know, most of the Congolese side of the copper belt from that perspective, at least. Okay, great. Thank you. We have another uh, anonymous question. Give me one moment. Okay. It's uh, to James. So following uh, Nicholas' comment about snowball herd, Jack Milton showed that glaciogenic brines could explain copper mineralization in redstone copper system in Canada. Have you given this thought? Well, uh, it's great. I'll, I'll read about that. No, no, I, I, and I read the uh, Herman's uh, comment. That, that's right. I mean, saline brines uh, would not freeze. But what, what I meant by snowball earth is that uh, if, if you know, surface and seawater to some extent is, is frozen, uh, how did it affect, did, does it, that affect, uh, you know, with the isostasy and so on, whatever happens uh, in, in the in the sphere? It's just it just you know it's an open question and I, uh, I'm I'm not focusing on that at all. It's just just that what I meant is is striking that uh, this is a highly endowed um, a part of the world in which you have basin development, uh, you have major orogeny, and also you throughout the I mean during the sedimentation and basin development of of that part of the world you had. A, the snowball earth so what could have you know did, did it have an, an effect or not uh that's an open question and maybe a, a fantastic uh, research idea for for people to investigate so no I've, i haven't expanded on that myself okay great jamie you want to continue we have another two questions yeah we do have a couple more um so if David Holwell, if you're still here, you can unmute yourself and you can ask your question about the, the Mafic uh, rocks. Daddy. Hey, yeah, uh, hi, uh, Philippe. Yeah, uh, you showed the um, uh, isotopic evidence for a mixed source, including a Mafic component. So uh, we've been doing some work interested in that sort of potential Mafic source of metal. So, uh, I was just wondering how significant that is from your data, uh, and is it restricted to a certain episode in the mineralization? Yeah, there was um, an example from uh, the Encana mine. It was um, that based on, on the, the earlier mineralization, that normally they were really in, in the felsic domain, yeah, and based on the cobalt rich uh, sample, there was a shift towards um, a lower uh, strontium and a higher neodymium isotopic composition. And this shift, which was related to um, a higher, well, a sample with a higher cobalt content as indicative for um, a, a mafic involvement. Um, so it was based on the comparison between cobalt poor sample and a cobalt rich sample where there was a shift in, in the isotopic composition. Hey, and uh, do, do you think that mafic component is a, is a significant Significant component in that metal source in that that stage, or or just a, just a small contributor? Um, yeah, <laughs> good question. Uh, a long a long uh, a long uh, uh, discussion has been going on on that. I, I, I'm based on 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 first of all, where do you get your cobalt from? Mm -hmm. uh, what is the major source of cobalt anyway? And I think there, um, just based on, on general geology. Uh, in a course uh, with students, I would propose uh, a mafic origin anyway. In addition, uh, we find that several places, um, nickel associate, for example, we find the association yeah. with nickel and the PGs at Chingolobwe in the Copper Belt. Um, it's studied by Jacques Chudbap, and he even at, he could identify many, many um, PG uh, minerals even at, at Chingolobwe. And then recently, um, we have this discovery of this nickel deposit. In, in the, the Zambian copper belt, indicating even the, the hydrothermal mobility of nickel. Um, and then if you have the combination of nickel, if you have the combination with cobalt and then the PGEs, um, then I would come to the conclusion that at least um, the mafic rocks play an important uh, role. In addition, if we go further yeah. north, northeast, 
Then we have uh, the, uh, the, the, the uh, deposits, the major deposits of nickel and PGEs, uh, also cobalt rich in um, the Musungati uh, area, uh, which is well known for, for, for this mineralization in, in Burundi and so on. So I think that this type of, of rocks uh, could as well be present in, in the deep, in the subsurface, in the basement, um, especially underlying um, the Congolese part of the copper belt, less uh, the Zambian, because there is, is just much less cobalt present with some local uh, exceptions. Okay, great, thanks it's, very much. It's, it's circumstantial evidence. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you very much. We are going to our last uh, question. Uh, I, I'm not sure if Andrew Becker is here, you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Yeah, yeah I'm just uh, wondering, uh, uh, considering that, uh, uh, many basins of Tonian age have evaporates and they have been uh, affected by orogenic processes. Uh, what makes uh, copper belt so unique? What, what is responsible for this uh, massive um, fluid circulation and alteration that they caused? Uh, I guess maybe Philippe and James maybe I, I can comment on that. Um, actually, it was a conclusion of my slide, but I skipped it because I was not really discussing things. But this is, um, um, many people have suggested, or many people have, have uh, proposed, but it's, it's, I think it's especially uh, Murray Hitzman who commented on this. And um, one of the main reasons is that this basin stayed uh, closed. So it was not never a really an open basin and all the fluids which were there continue circulating in, in the area. And if you compare this, for example, with the Kupferschiefer basin, it's a similar basin. It, it was always a closed basin, um, never open to a, to a real um, ocean. Um, and it's this limited area um, with full of, of these um, highly saline uh, fluids, which caused um, this, these deposits. Um, but Jamie can maybe comment on that. James? Yeah, no, to, to, totally agree in terms of um, the longevity of the, the basin and, and remaining stable and closed for a long period of time. And yeah, I guess, yeah, it was also my kind of concluding comments that, um, you know, this is one of the reasons why perhaps, particularly when we're looking for more deposits, we shouldn't get too hung up necessarily on on fixed models with individual mineralization ages or or events because i think that's one of the things that makes the copper belt different to everywhere else is that that's you know that's not necessarily the model to follow and perhaps we'd be better off just looking at the different components of the system in terms of source you know reservoir source of fluids source of brine source of metal um and then the, the the relevant chemical and structural traps and looking looking along those lines as opposed to constraining ourselves to to a part of the basin geographically or or stratigraphically uh, on the basis of of an interpreted kind of timing yeah if you if you just look at nicolas data all data were from kamoto they range between 609 and 473 million years at one deposit. This is a time span of 140 million years at one ore deposit. So, so just maybe to ask you more about it uh, in terms of uh, so sulfur is a top data uh, suggest connection to the global ocean and I presume your strontium data would be also consistent with some connection to global ocean. So in a way, it might be interesting to compare to similar age basins like in uh, Canadian Rocky Mountains, like uh, uh, Mackenzie Mountains or Shayla Group, but also have evaporites. Uh, they were rift basins where probably were partially connected to the global ocean and uh, they were later affected by regenesis. And so the question like what makes copper belts so different 
and they also had a long history of evolution. Yeah, also, yeah, I can't comment on that because I'm not I'm not familiar with, with uh, the area. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. Okay, guys. I think with that question, I think we should wrap up this session. It's half past seven in the UK and I want some dinner. So that's basically the reason. No, it's, it's not. It's just we, we have a little bit of a time restriction. Um, but thank you for everybody who's asked questions. Thank you to all of our speakers who has given their time and has presented their data for us. Um, if you want further information, the papers are published out there. But also there was a symposium called the James Moyle Symposium, which was run by the Society for Economic Geology. You can find it on their website. Um, in supporting that, actually, you are contributing to a fund that essentially is going to help produce um, the next generation of Zambian geologists. So it's a really good cause to kind of support at the same time as basically teaching yourself more about the copper belt. So if you want to do that, by, uh, go ahead. Um, thank you for everybody that's attended. Um, we obviously have uh, talks coming up in the future. Uh, we'd love you for to attend. Um, if you uh, essentially want to view this later this will be on YouTube but aside from that it's a uh, goodbye from me <laughs> and uh, we'll see you next time cheers thank you bye bye